On August 28, 2021, I had to pack my whole world, my past and future, everything I ever owned in a small backpack. How much do you think I could take? Could I take my family, my friends, or my dreams? I took none except for my dreams and I had to leave within minutes. I traveled the length of Afghanistan, crossing through eight provinces. But as soon as I stepped out of my home, I came across a street that wasn't familiar to my eyes. I crossed through provinces that were alien to what I've known about them. They were all silent, quiet, and deserted, as if they were all in mourning. I took into the road with the hope that I would leave, with the hope that I wouldn't be stopped on a Taliban checkpoint to be searched or shot. And I was shaking with the mere question of, would I make it? That was the only time I didn't know where was my destiny or if there would be any at all. But I had to keep reminding myself of the new reality for me and for my country. In fact, I was born as a refugee two years before 9-11. And I entered my homeland, which was emerging back from the rebels. And as the city was taking shape, hopes were sprouting all around. A new life was beginning for the nation, and we were all putting our hearts into it. Schools are open for girls, and as a little girl, I started going to school. After finishing my high school, I kept pursuing my higher education at one of the biggest public universities in Afghanistan studying law. Don't be surprised if I tell you that I survived by chance during all those years. My school had been shattered multiple times during suicide bombing attacks. And my university was attacked by terrorists in which dozens of students were shot right in the midst of the lecture. And I remember returning after each incident and sitting in a place whose walls have been painted white to cover the red color of students' blood splashed on them. And then it was 2021, the last semester of my studies. While working on my thesis and fussing over our graduation day with my classmates, our discussions started to change from how to celebrate our graduation to where can we seek refuge and protection. That was the time when the districts and provinces started to collapse one after another. And today, I became a refugee all over again. During the first few months of uncertainty, displacement and desperation, I turned every stone and knocked every door just to get back to class. And I eventually found a way to proceed with my education, an exceptional opportunity very few Afghan girls have today. Knowing the significance of the privilege that I had to continue my education and the survival guilt I felt while seeing millions of girls my age deprived of their very basic right to study back home, I decided not to be a passive bystander and start raising voice and support for those back home. So I volunteered and got engaged in activities and debates that were closely related to the unfortunate setbacks in Afghanistan. But what I faced was shocking. I found that in this part of the world, the position at the policymaking level to be one of patronizing well-meaning pity. But what struck me the hardest was a widespread sense of mourning for Afghanistan. All I heard was what went wrong with NATO's mission in Afghanistan and what lessons can be learned for their future missions and adventures. It was all about them. And this is probably what you will read if you Google Afghanistan in your smart spoons right now. It was all about them, but what about the other side of the story? For them, it was a mission gone wrong, but for us, it was a life in crisis. For them, it was a wrap-up, but for us, it was families separated, lives destroyed, poverty and hunger ruling our lives and existence all over again. Lost, gone, finished, and done. 
This is all I hear when people talk about my country nowadays. This is the mainstream perception defining a nation and its worth. But what hurts me the most is the way these mainstream perceptions are minimizing our stories and taking away the base from the strongest power of Afghanistan, the youth. Demographically speaking, 75% of Afghanistan's population is under 25 years of age. But what happens when you put failure into the thought process, into the minds and bodies of a nation, and especially its young people? What happens when you call them finished and done, just because their political systems failed to protect them in their futures? But this is the mainstream perception pushed by media and policymakers around the world. It is true that the political failure is an undeniable reality, but it's not the whole story. And we often underestimate the power of false narratives and the subconscious counterproductive consequences they have on people and their realities. So in December 16, 2019, I tried to share a different side of Afghan story with the world while representing Afghan youth at the United Nations. I shared the story of these incredible young women who made it to the global technology and science competition with their hard work, intellect, and passion. But I also shared the story of young people like Sahil, a small breadwinner for his family and a big dreamer for his country, and whose stories among those that often don't make it to the news but embody the resilient, strong spirit of my generation. There are true narratives about Afghanistan. Yes, the political system was corrupt. Yes, suicide bombing attacks were daily routines in our lives. Houses were bombarded in the middle of the night. Educational opportunities were scarce, and even for those with access, the system was barely surviving. But to insist only on these negative stories is to actually overlook many other stories that also shaped us. This is a, a picture of a street in Kabul. Our small city was getting grimmer and darker with the sight of these gigantic blast walls that surrounded politicians to protect them from bullets and bombs. But that's how the young artists changed the image of our city. Yes, politicians were building walls, but we were tearing them down with our colorful brushes to change the image of that ugly imposed reality in our cities and our lives. And these stories are the stories of the unbreakable resolves of young people who were, who were born and bred into systematic hate and conflict, but never lost their faith in peace and humanity and art and life. When I shared the stories of these incredible young people at the United Nations, that was the time when the Afghan peace process was getting shaped for the first time after four decades of war. That was the time when we, aware of how we became fuels to the wars of politicians who were never meant to bear the consequences of their decisions, we have decided to own our future and decide what is good and what is actually better for the, our generation and generations to come. So we have created a nationwide network of young people and we stood together in solidarity to bring peace from the negotiating table to the ground. We didn't want just a seat at the table. What we wanted was to end a war that wasn't ours. What we wanted was to define our future with our own terms and to take our faith into our own hands. We have been told that peace is about politics. And in politics, there is no space for young people and children. We'd rather study. We have been told that we are too young to really understand what is good for our country and the future of our country. We have been dismissed and denied, and the politicians decided what we feared. And then they left yet another myth to my generation to deal with. Today, 
young Afghans, wherever they are, either inside the country or scattered around the world, for them, survival is the new resistance. Young boys, they are still going to schools, wherever they have access. And young women, they still try to seek alternative means to continue their path to progress in education, and even bravely taken to the street to ask for what is rightfully theirs. But today, I would like to ask you this question. Would you care? And would you believe in the false mainstream perceptions pushed by media and policymakers around the world, or if you would like to be on the right side of history? And it's only after you choose to be on the right side of history is when you would see that how much beside the false mainstream perception and the oppressive system that is ruling over this incredible younger generation, how much the unfair, unjust conditions imposed by Western states also damage Afghan youth and deprive them of all the means and all the possibilities to survive through and continue their path to progress. It's unbelievable that today in the 21st century, the world would allow sanctions that only punish civilians in order to put pressure on culprits and oppressors. And what Afghans, Afghan youth are protesting for and demanding for today is a fight that they have taken upon themselves on behalf of all of us, on behalf of all freedom-loving people of the world. They have proven that they are not failed and done. And I'm sure that the free-thinking people of the world everywhere will ensure that young Afghans are not forgotten. My story is only one of the millions of stories of those silent resistance. Read about them learn their names, follow their work, and rest assured that what they have achieved over decades may be suppressed today, but can never be erased. Because the history has proven that peaceful resistance always overcome suppressive regimes. Because they can cut all the flowers, but they can never stop the spring from coming. Thank you very much.